So. Yeah, we put bell bottom. Or mohawk. I would show you my bell bottom, but that might be inappropriate at church. <laughs> All right, so. I have no idea what are bell bottoms. Huh? Anyway, we are glad you guys are here today. My name is Tim Bycroft. I'm one of the pastors here at the Point Church. And if you were offended by that first joke, my email is obviously uh, Sarah at the Point. WH. So, all right, we're glad you guys are here. Hey, if you've been around the Point for a while, you know why we exist, why we do the things that we do. Would you say that with me? Uh, the Point exist to welcome the unchurched to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And we know that we do this by pointing people to God, pointing people to Jesus, and pointing people to church, which is uh, the community in which we belong, where we learn to encourage and equip one another in this journey of following Jesus and becoming uh, more like him as his disciples. How many of you have heard Somebody say something like this, or maybe you have uttered these words, I just couldn't resist. Anyone? Anyway, ever do that? You know, um, I can't help but think about the times where Mindy and I are driving to the restaurant, right? And I have made up my mind, salad. Salad. <laughs> Stick with the salad. Going to get the salad. Mindy, remind me, salad, I'm getting the salad, the chicken, you know, the grill, not just the grilled chicken salad, whatever it is, light dressing, salad. Then we get to the restaurant, and the audacity of the person sitting next to me to get the, you know, bacon triple cheeseburger deluxe with the hand-cut fries with the special seasoning is sitting there munching on this bad boy as the waiter or waitress comes to our table and asks me, what do you want? Salad, right? Salad. That salad. I'm going to get salad. Salad. I want that triple cheese, double extra bacon. Bring it. I want those hand cut fries with your special seasoning. Yeah, bring it. And then later you're just like, how'd that happen? I couldn't, you know, I couldn't resist. And so when they ask for drinks, I'm like, okay, Diet Coke. Anyway, now, it seems kind of funny, but I'm going to guess there's probably some areas in all of our lives, to some degree or another, where we say, I just couldn't resist. And they might be a little bit more serious than ordering a cheeseburger over a salad. And you know these things that are in your life. I don't, I don't have to even point them out to you. You know that there's things you're just like, I know I don't want to do this. <coughs> I know I don't want to partake in this. I know that this isn't good for me. But you end up doing it, buying it, clicking on it, eating it, drinking it, smoking it, saying it, betting on it, or telling someone about it, you know, or just watching it. Whatever the case may be, all of a sudden you, there's something you're just like, I don't, this isn't good for me. And you end up doing it. You just couldn't resist. If you're ever vulnerable to giving in to temptation, okay, um, and I'm going to guess that all of us are to some degree or another in here today, this is what I'd like for you to understand. And, and, and it may be like you're going to say, no way, couldn't be. Jesus actually understands. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say this. Jesus has been there. He's been tempted in the same ways with the same temptations that we have, okay? And, and as Christians, this is what I want to try to accomplish today. If you're a Christian in here, we know that we serve a God that's much stronger than the temptations that we face. As a matter of fact, we have a God who promises that there is a way to overcome the temptation. As a matter of fact, he makes a promise that he will always give us an off-ramp, an escape route, a way not to fall into this trap of temptation. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at today. Let's pray, and then we're going to jump in. God, I pray today that uh, we can at least be honest with ourselves, 
about the fact that there are things in our lives that we know take us further away from you than draw us closer to you. And so today, God, I pray that uh, we would do maybe some self-reflection and just determine, God, that there are things that we know we don't want to do anymore. And I pray today, Lord, that we would maybe better than we ever have sense your strength, your potential to move away from these temptations. Lord, that you've given us a way out, so Lord, help us to seek those ways out, uh, those way out. And, and, and we pray this in Jesus' powerful name, amen. amen. That's what I want you to do today. As we go into this, I want you to just stop and think. There's probably something in your life that in the past, maybe <laughs> this morning, you said, man, I have a hard time resisting. And, and it's something you know isn't healthy for you, takes you further away from God. And I want you to kind of focus in on that. I want you to listen to this message through the lens of that temptation, if you will, uh, because it seems too difficult for you to defeat. Just, you know, been tempted, say it, look at it, touch it, eat it, whatever the case may be. Jesus understands. As a matter of fact, the reason that I know that Jesus understands is the gospel writer Matthew, when he's talking about Jesus, he said, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by who? The devil, Satan. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. As a matter of fact, I would say this. If Satan has the audacity to go after Jesus... He's probably going to go after us. Look at verse 3. After, after fasting, <laughs> this is like the most obvious verse in the Bible. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I fast for four hours and I'm hangry. <laughs> the tempter, Satan came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones, right? You can, just, you can just picture there's probably some smooth stones out there that look like a loaf of bread. And Satan goes, so uh, if you're hungry, why don't you just ask God to turn these uh, stone into bread? Problem solved. <coughs> Even Jesus, the son of God, was tempted by Satan. So, that begs the question, what does it mean to be tempted? What does it mean to be tempted? Um, I, I found this definition. I really like it because I think it really just narrows the focus on what temptation really is all about. Temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of your obedience to God. Temptation is something that promises, and I would also put in here maybe, temporary satisfaction that takes you off the course of, of obedience to God. Satisfaction leads you away from the will, the purposes of God. So, um, for example, <laughs> you're hurting. For whatever, for whatever reason, you're hurting, and all of a sudden, there is this lure. <laughs> There's this lure that you've used in the past to try to numb your brain, kill the pain, whether it's a drink, the pills, some other drug, and that temptation is there. All of a sudden, this pain comes up. You've dealt with it before in some unhealthy ways, but there's that temptation to be drawn back into it. Or you're feeling lonely, and so you decide to look at something that you shouldn't look at. You binge on porn, okay? That's a real thing. It's one click away going to fill that void that you feel like it's not being filled right now. And so you go and you look at things that you know take you further away from the will of God because there's this thrill, there's this relief. <coughs> and it gives it to you for a moment. And then like most people who, you know, have experienced this, after that moment of thrill, after that moment of relief, then there's guilt. And you're more lonely after that guilt sets in than you were before. 
where you feel low and feel a little down, you feel a little unworthy, maybe you're depressed with just life that's going on. And, and one of the ways that you think you're going to feel better about yourself is if you just gossip about somebody else or just talk down about somebody else because you think that's elevating you. And it's going to pull you out of this rut of feeling bad about yourself. And we all know that when we do that, it takes us further away from God. The temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. So how does, how does temptation start? There's got to be some place where this temptation sets in. And I, I'm going to look at like a four-step process that I, I think you'll all agree with me. This probably is how this works. There's like a four-step process. And the first process toward doing something, falling into temptation, is this. It starts with a thought. And then it clicks into your imagination. And then we have justification. And then we make our choice. Right? The thought. There's this thought. You know, I, uh, I feel depressed. Okay? So to get me out of my depression, I'm going to go buy that outfit. Or I'm going to go buy that, I don't know, fishing pole. <laughs> that new gun. <laughs> Whatever it is. I don't know. You're going to buy something. You're going to spend money on something. And then all of a sudden what happens after that first initial thought is you start imagining what I'm going to look like in that new outfit. <laughs> start practicing your poses in the mirror. And why do you do that? Why, why? Oh, anyway. What? Instagram. My wife's saying, don't do it. I can't. It's temptation. Why is it that some of you ladies do this in public restrooms in the mirror? I don't get it. Anyway, so you start thinking about what that's going to look like when you take your gram picture and, and put it on the gram, you know? And, and so you, you start thinking about this. And, and, and so there's, there's this like image of what you're going to be doing. And then there's justification, right? You start justifying it because I've worked really, 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 really hard. And, and, and I've had a really, really, really rough time. And so I'm going to find this thing on 20% off. Um, and so, yes, I'm going to do this. And so then the choice comes. I'm like, okay, we got bills to pay. Um, but gosh. I, I think I need to get this. But I, I also need to get the shoes to match, the purse to match, and the watch to match. And, well, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> you know, and, and that's kind of the process. Tell me that's not kind of how that works. There's first there's this thought, and, and, and then we start imagining what it's going to be like to get us out of our depression or get us out of our hurt or get us out of whatever, and then we justify it going, you know, we really deserve to have this. I, deserve, I shouldn't have to go through this type of pain, and this is going to help. And then we end up making a terrible decision. It happens all the time. And if it doesn't happen to you, let me tell you, friends, it happens to me. A thought creeps in there, I think about it, and then I move on it. Um, and, and, and here's the thing. With the justification, sometimes we say things like, Honestly, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. Hear me on this. This is how this works. By the way, our spiritual adversary uses justification amazingly. He will say things to you like this. It's no big deal. Everybody's doing it. Hey, they put it out there anyway. My, my spouse isn't paying me much of attention, so hey, if I can get attention enough, God wouldn't want you to be lonely. I might as well just look. I might as well just buy. I might as well just taste. And Satan all along is just feeding you this, going, do it, do it, do it. It's not that big of a deal. Everybody else is doing it. Do it, do it, do it. And you step across the line in that temptation, and this is how Satan goes on the backside of that temptation. When you make the wrong choice, he goes, I can't believe you just did that. And then guilt and shame 
and more pain, and you're back further than you were when you first started. And this is Satan's awful, awful trick that he creates in our lives often with this simple thing called a thought. That's where it starts. So what we want to do is we want to decide, hear me on this, Christians, hear me on this. We decide that we're going to fight back. And God has given us a way in which we can fight back against an adversary that wants to take us down. And the way that we fight back is simply this, with God's word. God's word is the way in which we conquer and overcome temptations. Let me give you three truths about temptations from God's word. The first one is, hear me on this. Sin, uh, temptation is not the sin. It's, it's, not, it's not a sin to be tempted. You're going to be tempted. Um, you know, if somebody says, like, I've, I've been tempted, therefore I have failed, that's not necessarily true. As a matter of fact, going back to where G I said Jesus has been there, he's done this. Listen to what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 4. He says, Jesus, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet... He did not sin. Okay? So Jesus has been tempted. We've been tempted. It's Jesus models that we can be tempted and not sin. It's actually not a sin to be tempted. You're going to be tempted. And what we have to understand is this, that if you're going to become a Christian, it doesn't mean that you'll never, ever be tempted again. As a matter of fact, unfortunately, I would say this. That when you become a Christian, hear me on this, there's somebody who's going to get baptized today. I'm excited about that. But I will tell you, if you talk to anybody who's been baptized or, or, or gave their life over to Jesus Christ, I will tell you that all of a sudden, those temptations become more real than ever before. Amen. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. Because this is the moment when you step away from the darkness into the miraculous light of Jesus Christ, when you step into the light, your spiritual enemy is going to do everything he can to try to grab you back and steal you back away from God, to keep you from God's word, fulfilling his will. Don't be surprised when the enemy attacks, when you're being more obedient to God's will and purpose and meaning in your life. And when you're tempted, don't blame God, okay? God is not the one who tempts us. Well, God is tempting me to do this. No. God is not tempting you to do this. God is not tempting you. I will say this. God may test you, but he never tempts you. God may test you, but he never tempts you. This is what scripture says. This is the brother of Jesus. He says this. James 1. Remember... When you're being tempted, there it is again, you will be tempted. Remember, do not say, God is tempting me, because God is never tempted to do wrong, and he will never tempt anyone else. So that begs the question, where does temptation come from? James responds, temptation comes from our own desires, okay, which entice us, drag us away, and then what do these desires do? They give birth to sinful actions, and when the sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Those are some serious implications of temptation that leads to sin, which leads to death. Why may God test you? He will, but he'll never tempt you. But the reason I think God tempts us many times, and, and this is a sermon for another day. I wish I could go into this, um, but here's my teaser. <laughs> I think that God tests us to promote us and the devil tempts us to make us fail. God tempts us to promote us, to get us to, to propel forward in life and to promote us, but the devil will always tempt you to fail, to pull you back, to keep you away from the will and the purpose and the meaning of life that God wants you to have. So it's not a sin to be tempted. Number two, you're most vulnerable to temptation when you're weak, <laughs> and you're most vulnerable to temptation when you think you're strong, okay? 
Uh, let, me, let me talk about that for just a second. You're most vulnerable when you're generally weak. And you're most vulnerable when you think you're just generally strong. When Satan tempted Jesus, think about this. We're going to go back to Jesus. When Satan was tempting Jesus out in the desert, okay, remember this. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. Satan doesn't come up to Jesus and go, hey, Jesus, I think this would be a good time for you to gossip about Peter. He doesn't use that tactic. What is the tactic, tactic he says? Hey, Jesus, I think right now would be a good time for you to turn this bread or these stones into bread. He attacked Jesus where? Where Jesus was vulnerable, where he was weak at that moment. Jesus was hungry, it says. He was vulnerable in that moment. Guess where Satan comes to attack him? In his weak moment. Okay? And that's what's going to happen. Think about this. That's what's going to happen with us. When you think, you know, uh, you're vulnerable and weak, man, that's probably where Satan's going to come and attack you. And, and this, is, this is the antidote to that. You're only as strong as you are honest. This is the tough part. This is the vulnerability part. This is the point in which you can have some of your best defense in place when you're open, you're transparent, and you're vulnerable with others. Because there are times where you are weary and you're vulnerable and I'm not, and the opposite is true. There's times where I'm weary and I'm vulnerable and you're not, and guess what? When the body of Christ is functioning the way it should be, that means when you're vulnerable and weary and weak, guess what? We can pray for you. And when I'm vulnerable and weak and weary and it happens, and I'm open and transparent and honest with you, guess what? I know that I can count on you to pray for me. Amen. This is the body of Christ. It's the greatest defense we can have. It's one of the greatest defenses we can have against the temptations of someone, our adversary, Satan, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy what God loves the most, which is his church. Okay? Um, be open, transparent when you're angry, you're vulnerable. When, you're, when things are just not going right in your life, you're vulnerable. You're ticked off, you're vulnerable. When you're lonely, you're vulnerable. When you're hurting, you're vulnerable. And the best thing that we can do sometimes is just be transparent with others. And let people know where you're at so they can pray with you. You need to be aware of those times when you're vulnerable, when you're weak. And you also can be vulnerable <laughs> when you think you're strong. This might be the more tricky one. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, chapter 10, if you think you're standing firm, when you think you're standing firm, when you think, wow, I got this, things are going great, be careful that you do not fall. Uh, there's times that we're vulnerable and we think, wow, we're, we're just doing great. That life is good. And sometimes that may be the most vulnerable when we think that we're actually strong. And that's why this, that's why, hear me on this. That's why the scriptures warn us to stay alert. Stay alert and, and watch out for your great enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. These are the words shared in scripture about who Satan is, our great adversary. Can I tell you right now? Everybody take a deep breath. Thank you, I needed that. I see in our culture right now, I felt it in my own life. Far too many of us as Christians are playing a Christian game, like a Christian Monopoly game, where we think we carry around our get out of hell free card, and that's it. We're good. But the truth is, we have a sworn enemy who's coming after no one than you and me as Christ followers. And the Bible says 
that he wants to devour our marriages. He wants to destroy your finances. He wants to crush your testimony. He wants to rob your peace. And hear me this. Hear him. Just If you don't see this in our culture, I beg you to open your eyes and see that we have an adversary who's doing everything to steal, kill, and destroy our children. you understand this? Because Christianity is not a playground. Christianity is a battleground. And Christians, we got to stop playing. And we need to go to battle. And the more that you do the will of God... The more of the forces of darkness will come after you. What hurts the most is many times Satan won't attack you, but he will attack the ones you love the most. It's his tactic that he uses with God since the very beginning. So don't be surprised that when you're tempted, when, when you're doing the will of God, that the enemy comes after you. So the Bible says, stay alert, be on guard, stay alert, be on God. Hear me on this. If you know that Satan is coming after you, hear me on this. If you know that Satan is coming after you, shut the door in which he's trying to come through. If you know Satan is coming after you and you see his tactics coming your direction, shut the door. He's coming through. Satan will attack the same door <clears throat> over and over and over and over again. He doesn't necessarily need to come up with a new tactic if you're not shutting the door. Temptation often comes through the same door. Hear me on this, and I know this is hard. But I'm talking to myself just as much as anybody else. Hear me on this. I'm talking to Tim right now. Temptation often comes through the door that has been deliberately left open. Because we don't want to shut the doors of comfort often, even though we know that Satan is using the door of comfort in our lives. I can just get in your business. I haven't gotten your business yet. I'm about to. <clears throat> I can tell you that almost every time you give in to something, into a, every, almost every time that I've given in, that the people that I talk to have given in to the temptation, <laughs> it's never a first time. It's never a first time that that temptation has been there. The, the reason you gave in to it is you've probably given in to it before. And you've deliberately left the door open. So Satan's just going to come right back in. And one of the best ways to resist temp temptation. One of the best ways to eliminate temptation. So you don't fall into the trap of sin. Is this. Eliminate the door. Eliminate the door. Lock the door. Throw away the key. Make Satan figure out another way to come at you. Stop using the same door. If he came at you before, he's going to come after you again through the same way. Make him figure out a way to do it again some other way. Put the, put the onus on him. Uh -huh. Can't come through that door. It's gone. Proverbs 14 says, or Proverbs 4 says this. Hear me on this. Do not, do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. <laughs> Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it. Go on the way in a different direction. I mean, it, the, right? If, there's, if there is a pit right here, if there is something that if I stepped one more foot over, I would fall to my death, what should I do? Lean towards it? Get away from it. It only makes sense, right? You move away from danger. How come it is with our spiritual life, we want to walk on the edge of danger? 
I mean, this passage of Scripture right here, I think, is like the, the Fred Sanford passage of Scripture. I think if Fred Sanford were saying this, he'd be like, hey, listen up, you big dummy. <laughs> Walk away. Get away from it. You know, it, you got to pay attention to what's happening around you. See what Satan is doing. Don't go near trouble. Turn from it. Go away. If you know where the devil might be attacking, close the door. Run. Forest. Run. <laughs> if you're battling alcohol, don't have your life group meet at the local bar. You laugh. It's happened. And then I watch people fall away and go, Run from it. Run from it. If you struggle with looking at someone when that's not your spouse, when you go to the gym, in other words, you're going to the gym and you're lusting after someone that's not your spouse, stop going to the gym. Get a video. Do something at home. You know, give a workout app or something on your phone. Do it. Do your workout at home. You don't have to go to the gym and put yourself in that spot. If that is a weakness, if that is a temptation. If every time you get on Instagram, you know, you get on the gram and all of a sudden you're more upset when you get off of it than when you got onto it. Because you're jealous of what other people are doing. How do they have this? Why don't I have that? Look at their life, which is probably just pictures of imagery that's not even true in their life anyway. Or a bathroom mirror. <laughs> Stop going on the gram. Delete. You can't hear me on this. I know this is, you're, you're going to think I'm making this up. Did you know that you can delete apps off your phone? <laughs> it's true. You can. And your life will probably be better. Right? <laughs> this is such an enlightening story. Uh, If you find yourself at the office enjoying the presence of someone who you're not married to and you're married to someone, you know, I'm telling you that little flirty, flirty thing where you walk by and, and you rub up against each other's hand and you look forward to that or, or so, and they're not your spouse. And, and, and you're thinking about them more than your spouse. Get out of it. Ask for a transfer. Ask for a transfer out. Look for another job. Yes, indeed. I said, if you're flirting with someone who's not your spouse at work, quit your job. I've said this to other people. It's no, some of you know, I've said this to you. Quit your job. Quit your job. It's far less important than allowing Satan to rob you from eternal salvation. You have to stop thinking about the temporary comforts of this world and start thinking about your eternal destiny. It would be better for you to quit your job than to continue to flirt with temptation. I might be looking for another job after this one anyway. <laughs> Because this isn't a game. It's not a game. And Christians, we have to stop playing a game and get into the battle. Don't mess with it, turn from it, avoid it, walk away from it, go away from it. One of the best ways to resist the temptation is to close the door completely on the temptation that Satan has used in the past. Whatever is within your power to shut the door to, shut it. Shut it. Now, I know that when I preach a sermon like this, I have had people come up to me and go, Tim, you're giving Satan far too much credit. Do you fear Satan? Honestly, I don't. As a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I don't fear Satan. I really don't. We should never fear Satan, but I will tell you this. I do respect the fact that he is a formal enemy of God. 
and will do everything he can to rob, steal, kill, destroy, maim that which God loves the most, which means he's coming after us. Therefore, why would I resist a temptation in the future if I have the power to eliminate it now? I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. So, it's not a sin to be tempted. And we have to be careful when we are weak, weary, and vulnerable, and, and, and we know that we're weak of this temptation. We all have to be careful of that we're vulnerable when we think we're strong, okay? Here's the last thing. Here's the good news. God always, hear me on this, God always gives us a way out. God will always, no matter what, no matter what we're facing, he will always, always, always give us a way out of the temptation that we're uh, finding ourselves in. Listen to these powerful life-giving promises of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Okay? Our God is. Who is our God? Our God is faithful. He is good. He is righteous. He is pure. Our God is faithful through and through. And so when he says, I will always give you a way out of this temptation, guess what he's going to do? He's going to give you a way out of this temptation. He's always going to give you an off-ramp. No matter what it is, where it is, where you're facing, how many times you've faced it, God will always give you an exit strategy out of the temptation that you're finding yourself in with Satan. He will always give you a way out, an off-ramp. But how? How does he do this? I'm going to tell you the most powerful way in which God will give you an off-ramp out of temptation. And as this, guys, we've got to get into his word. His word is the lamp in which will guide you out of temptation every single time. No matter what. God's word is truth. It's active. It's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any double-edged sword that you could ever use. The word is truth. And so you work the word in your life, and you live the word, and you internalize the word, and you memorize the word, and you internalize the word, and you meditate on the word, and you use the word to fight back against Satan and his temptations in your life. When these thoughts start coming in, when those initial thoughts start coming in, you cover those, you completely cover those temptations, those thoughts with the word of God. This is how Jesus did it. Let's go back to Jesus. Jesus, he's, he's in the desert, it's 40 days, he's hungry. <laughs> he's really hungry. And Satan comes up and he goes, hey, why don't you just uh, turn these stones into bread? Jesus, how did he defeat Satan in that moment? He quoted scripture. He said, people will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then he said, suck on that, Satan. <laughs> I think. I, I think. Jesus fought back with the word of God by the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The devil said, hey, you know, Jesus, why don't you just throw yourself down off this mountain and prove to everybody who you are because angels are going to come and they're going to serve you. They're going to protect you. They're going to heal you. Why don't you just do that to just prove to everybody who you are? And, and Jesus goes back to Satan and he simply says this. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Bite it, Satan. I think. The devil comes again. This is the third time. He says, hey, why don't you just bow down to me? You know, you're wanting all these kingdoms. You're wanting all this land. You're wanting all these people. Hey, I, I will help you achieve your goal, Jesus, if you would just bow down and worship me. Huh. Jesus says, Satan, God said, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now be gone. And he closes the door. He used the word. So what do we do? We work the word into our lives. We, we live the word. We internalize the word. We memorize the word. We meditate on the word. We, we, we fight back with the word of God when temptations come. 
The word will give you the way out. Why, church? Why do we need this? Because I'm seeing in our world today the draw, the temptation to move away from the obedience of God into the comforts of this world. And and the world belongs to, to Satan. And we belong to Christ. And so we need to be alert. Be alert. Be alert. Saints, be alert. Believers, be alert that the devil is roaming around like a roaring lion trying to take you down, take you out, put our lives of our kids in danger, lying to you, lying to them, lying about our marriages, trying to talk you out of the will of God and the promises of satisfaction and fulfillment that are so temporary, thinking those are what you can rely upon instead of who God is in your life, the Holy Spirit empowering you, providing for you, giving you the peace that passes all understanding. Satan wants to say, hey, I've got something better. And he doesn't. He just doesn't. The cost of your obedience to God, he's attacking. Be alert, be on guard. Something t- Satan attacks. He, 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 he tempts. We justify. He helps us with that justification. He pushes us towards those bad decisions. And then he says, what a fool are you? And you're trapped in that cycle of guilt and shame and sin and pain. Right? And this is not where we want to be. We want to be in the life-giving word of God. Here's, here's the thing. We're all going to fall into that trap. Can I, can I just say that? That we're all probably going to fall into that trap of thoughts that move to imagination, that move to justification. We're all going to make choices. And sometimes our choices, and probably far too often our choices, are, are sinful and they move us away from God. So what do we do? Can I, can I just say, there's, we need to have a sorrow inside of us. Can I say that? I, I think we actually have to have a sorrow. We don't, we don't talk about that uh, enough in our churches because we want the joy, 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 joy. Da, da, da. I get it. I, I do too. But I think there's a point in which we all need to also have a sorrow in our heart. Now, now there's two kinds of sorrow. There's a worldly sorrow. The Bible talks about this. There's a worldly sorrow. And that worldly sorrow is simply this. Dang it, I got caught. Man, I really wish I wouldn't have done that and got caught. That's a sorrow that many of us go through. Or the sorrow that like builds up this, hey, it's not a big deal. We, we want to get argumentative about the decision that we make. Or, or, or we want to push back on it and get kind of defensive or... You know, again, we just, we're just sorry that we got caught. Oh, man, I can't believe I got caught. And then we start making excuses and minimize the pain that we may have caused ourselves or someone else. <clears throat> the Bible calls that worldly sorrow. And it can take us, hear me on this, worldly sorrow just takes us further and further and further away from God. But the Bible also says there's something called godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is actually healthy. Godly sorrow is this deep, sincere brokenness that, oh my goodness, I've just hurt the heart of God. I just stepped further away from the creator God of the cosmos who loved me so dearly he gave his life for me. I just paid him. What that is, is repentance. My friends, repentance is a beautiful word. It's an amazing word. We've used it to beat people over the head, but I think it's a lovely, beautiful, amazing, powerful word, which simply means this. You have a godly sorrow that says, I know I got caught up into the temptation. I succumbed to that temptation, and I am so humbly sorry. I don't want to do it again. That's the heart of repentance. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. And I don't want to fall into that again. It's a repentant heart. It's a a godly 
sorrow. And that godly sorrow ultimately is what leads us to that pure joy, 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 joy down in the earth. Because it leads to life. Paul says this, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But worldly sorrow only (laughs) brings death. Godly sorrow leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Man, here's the great news that even though (laughs) we have thoughts and we have imaginations of, man, if we would just do this, I would feel so much better about myself. I would I would find that satisfaction. I'd find that contentment. I would I would find that joy. If I just if I just did this one thing, then Satan brings our imagination to a boil and we start thinking what our life is going to be like. And and then we start justifying moving further and further away into this pit, away from God, into this, oh man, I deserve this. I need this. And it's so easy to get caught up into this trap of justification to where we step over the edge and we sin. But praise be to God, we have a God who loves us, who is so full of mercy and grace and love and forgiveness that each time we step across that line, each time we fall into that bed, each time that we we step further away from God, he comes and meets us right where we're at. Praise be to God that we have a God who loves us that much. And so we approach his throne with godly sorrow, with repentance. We approach his throne with confidence that he is the God over the universe. We approach his throne knowing that Satan is so less powerful than he is. And Satan has no authority over those who are in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Satan has no hold over us. Sin can't hold us. Death can't keep us. And we will spend eternity life, our eternal life, with Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, the God of creation, who loves us, who cares about us. So I pray. Let's pray. God, strengthen us, encourage us, give us eyes to see, hearts to hear, hearts to know your love, your grace, your mercy. God, I pray today that that the church would know that we're not on a playground. We're in a battlefield. And that you've called each and every one of us into the battle. The battle for our lives. The battle for the lives of each other in the church. Help us to be responsible for each other in this church. Help us to be responsible for the kids that are in our care. Help us to know that you are the one who gives us the strength, the power, the peace, the the perseverance to carry on the battle that you've called us to. God, I pray if there are people here today that have said, man, I have succumbed to that temptation far too much. God, that you would demonstrate, that you would reveal to them that it's never too far. You've never gone too far that you can't come and grab us, God, and love us and forgive us and demonstrate your grace on us. God, we pray. We pray that you would just reveal your spirit to us today, the power of your spirit through your Lord Jesus Christ.